Good morning. Welcome to our second day of the 20th Biennial World Conference of the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children. I'm Julia Link Roberts, a member of the Executive Committee, and I am honored this morning to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Sally M. Reese. Sally is Vice Provost for Academic Affairs at the University of Connecticut. Of course, Sally has a rich history of being engaged in gifted education. She is a terrific researcher with a long record of um, interesting publications. She has been active in various associations for gifted and talented children. But best of all, Sally is a warm human being who is very interested in providing service, both to the field for all of us as professionals, but also for young people. And I am pleased to call Sally a colleague, a friend, and to welcome her to the podium, Sally. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and to spend this hour with you. And um, I do want to say uh, how gratified I was to receive the award. And I did ask Julia to keep my introductions short, since those of you here last night heard it, um, heard, heard enough. <laughs> Let me just say that. Uh, I'll be spe actually. I changed my my speech after I got the email from uh, Tassir and and the World Conference indicating that I'd won the research award. I am still going to speak about creativity and creative productivity, but I'm I'm actually going to reflect a little bit. I find that um, when you live a busy life, you don't take time for reflection. Very uh, many of us. I won't speak for everyone. Take time for reflection very often. So, what I decided to do was to speak a little bit about uh, the work that I've done over the last 30 years. Um, and in thinking about it, I spent a, a couple of days actually trying to decide which of the studies that I did in gifted education I thought A, were the most meaningful to the field, because it isn't about me, but also have the most um, predictability for being important in the future. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. They all, they all lead to a few themes. I want to again thank you for the award, award, but also for the opportunity to reflect on 30 years of work, which I rarely do. Um, and just to say again how grateful I've been, I have been to work in a field um, where I've had so many opportunities to work with so many people. I would also be remiss if I didn't say that I worked with Julia. I was president of the National Association for Gifted Children. She was the legislative chair. I worked with her over many of the years that she was working very hard to establish the high school at WKU. And I just want to say from a personal basis, my friend, I am so proud of you and the work you've done and what you've created here. I was thinking about it last night. Everybody should have such a legacy, Julia. Well done. So. Anyway, the, um, the path that I've taken and the research that I've done has been really a, a subject probably of a, a couple of different births. One, um, because I was a teacher of gifted and talented students, and second, because I had the rare privilege of marrying my best friend and working as a partner with him for the last 30 years. We've been together for over 35 years. And so those two things, I married to Joe Renzulli. A lot of people don't know that. We use different names. But those two things actually have been um, critically important in my life. So today, I'm going to reflect a little bit about why creativity and creative productivity should be so important in our field, in every country that you represent. Which of my studies has mattered the most to me and why? Um, why is research in these areas still so critical? And last, what do we hope our, our gifted and talented students and high potential children will become in the future? So I first um, entered the field of gifted education. I know this will shock you because I don't at all look my age. <laughs> That's a, that was, a, that was the, the levity in the speech. Um, 
I entered the field in, in 1975, actually. I began a, a teaching gifted and talented children. And then in 1976, which is about my fourth year of teaching, I was asked to coordinate a gifted program in Connecticut, which was my hometown. I had gone to college in the 1960s. I went to college in 1968, which was an amazing time to be a college student, as you can well imagine. Some of you remember those heady days. And I, I graduated with a group of young people that were optimistic and feeling that we could change the world, that we could become a part of a revolution of change. And so, like many of the other young people of my age, I decided to try to make a difference. I went back to my hometown, and in my hometown, I never talk about these things, but in my hometown, I started a gifted program and taught in the middle school where I had been a bored, disinterested, academically advanced student who got into trouble all the time. Now those people who knew, know me now and know that I've grown up to be quite a responsible and I would say most days a relatively good person might find it unusual to know that I was a troublemaker, but I was. I was so bored, so unhappy in school, and I just thought I could make a difference. I taught um, for many years. I taught for 15 years. So being a university professor is actually my second career as a teacher and director and coordinator um, in, in the school district in which I had gone to school. And I have had the great privilege of living long enough to hear from many of my former students. So. I will not bore you with all of the uh, great out outreach stories that I've had, but this is, a, this is a highlight. Sally, a few years ago I emailed you about my doctoral program work and described my research in pharmacological chemistry. I also reminded, reminded you of all of the type 3 products I did in the TAG program, Talented and Gifted program. I finished my doctorate, have been invited to give a seminar at UConn in the School of Pharmacy next month. I was writing to see if you'd be available for lunch and perhaps you might be able to attend my seminar. Looking forward to reconnecting Sherry. Well, of course, I, I did have lunch. I did attend the seminar. I did not understand one word that Sherry said. And it reminded me of my experience in being in a gifted and talented program, directing, teaching, coordinating, because I based that on the work of my husband and partner, Joe Renzulli, and also then all of the interesting information and things that I learned from that experience, and really 15 years of kids and students and working with teachers and doing in service, the best possible training for a future researcher, and that's why I think it's important, even if you're teaching in this room, to be curious, to have an interest in learning why things work and what works and what works better than other things and the things we should be doing. So in um, yesterday in the very generous introduction about the research award, I mentioned that I've had 250 publications. I picked five or six to talk about today. You'll be glad to know and I promise you'll be out on time. The first, um, the first, and these are re really presented in terms of, of articles that made a difference, but also topics. The first was the first major research article that I published, and this was published with Joe in 1982, and it's called A Research Appro Approach for a Broadened Conception of Giftedness. This was a large-scale random assignment study in which we compared the creative products, creative productivity of the top 5% of gifted and talented students in the state of Connecticut, very large random assignment study, with the top creative productive products of the next 10 to 15% of the students. Finding that the quality of the creative productivity, the quality of the work, of students in the top 5% was no different. In fact, the mean scores were slightly lower than the creative productive work of the next 10 to 15%. This provided a research rationale for our talent pool approach, which is a part of the school-wide enrichment model, and also uh, a research, um, a very good research support for Joe's conception of giftedness, the three-ring conception of giftedness. And this led to the originations of the school-wide enrichment model, which has been the basis for most of the rest of my research and work over the next 20 to 30 years, indicating that we should not just be providing services, particularly related to creativity and creative productivity for a very small, narrow band of students, but rather 
If you're interested in creative, productive work, we ought to be doing those kinds of opportunities, those kinds of activities for more students. And that, that's a key part of the research that we've done. That's a key part of what we've looked at over the years. So the, the, the other thing that has, that has led to has been a lifelong interest for me and looking at the outcome of being in a gifted program. There are about seven of us that have been studying the lives and the experience of children that graduated from gifted programs 20 or 30 years ago. And the news is very, very good. Um, for example, in Torrington, a small blue collar, very high poverty town, the town in which I grew up and lived the majority of the first part of my life, six young people did this type three project in which they created a skeletal frame of a model of something that we called Bobby Bones. These students were interested in anatomy and physiology, and as part of the work that they did, they worked for over six months to create this, to do a videotape, to create a small book. Bobby Bones traveled all over our school district. These kids gave lectures on, on anatomy and physiology. I know exactly what happened to these students. I know where they went. I know what happened to them. I know their experiences. Four of the group, four, are practicing physicians. And all of those practicing physicians indicate that the reason that they did this work was because of their type three experiences in elementary school. These projects matter. Opportunities for creative productivity matter. The second um, study that I'd like to talk about is the study that I began early in the 19, late in the 1980s on gifted girls and women. <clears throat> this is a, a passionate part of my work. I had many publications from various data, databases. I, um, I studied young girls in math and science. I studied um, older women. Probably my favorite study was women of eminence who achieved eminence after 50, after age 50. That is, after their major childbearing years and after they, they raised their families, they put all of their effort and energy into their work. And this journey was a long one culminated in a book that I wrote called Work Left Undone, as well as I said, many publications. But what came out of it was a model of talent realization in women that varied a little bit from several other models. And that is, and this has been widely published as well, a model in which women's talents are manifested by not just above average ability, not just a series of personality traits, including creativity and patience and determination, not just in a strong belief in self, not just in environmental factors that support them, but also, and this is where it's very different from men, in the belief that what they want to do is socially important. So all of the women that I studied, all of them, manifested what Joe talked about last night, and that was a determination to make the world, or their part of the world, a better place. In so many ways, this is what led to their desire to develop their talents. And by the way, the realization of these talents were in all kinds of areas, in teaching, in mathematics, in business, in social causes, and in what I, I labeled maternal and family giftedness. I was just recently, I've recently been reading about Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin's sister. <laughs> he had a sister named Jane. She was equally brilliant, equally committed, equally interested, and her whole life was about childbearing. She had 15 children. The vast majority of them never did not survive, most died. She wrote to him so longingly about the life that he had, about the opportunities that he had, about the chances that he had to make a difference. And when I, I think about the world today, I realize how lucky some of us are to live in countries where our talents as girls and women can be celebrated, but many other people do not. <laughs> Do not, and I think this is one of the key issues today. A second article that I did in this theme of gifted and talented women related to the diversification of creativity in women. Why are there so many fewer women inventors? Why are there so many fewer women scientists, Nobel Prize winners? Part of it is that women diversify their creativity so much. 
So if you think a little bit about men that we've studied, gifted men, almost all of their creativity is diversified into two areas, work and family usually in that order, and that's, self, that, that's men telling us this. But when you look at women, so many of them, and the women that I studied, highly creative, productive women, American pioneers, women who were artists, women who were entrepreneurs, women who were senators and governors that I was, had the ability to study, their, their creativity is diversified across multiple areas, service to others, friendships, interests, their personal appearance, their homes, the way that they want to live, their spirituality, as well as their work. And so I, I've written about this, that women have a much more diverse creative life but seldom have the volume of work that talented men do because they, the, it, the journey for them is so much more interesting and so much of their creativity and creative potential is diversified. I do want to say this. I read a book, actually it was the Yukon Reads book a couple of years ago called Half the Sky. And this quote from Half the Sky moved me tremendously. Why study gifted women, gifted girls? In the 19th century, the central moral challenge was slavery, says Nick Kristof, who wrote the book. In the 20th century, it was the battle against totalitarianism. And, and Kristof and his wife believe that in this century, the paramount moral challenge will be the struggle for gender equity around the world. Half the women in the world today live without the opportunities to develop their talents. Half do not even have education that takes them through the eighth grade. So if we think a little bit about the importance of studying gifted girls and women, this probably couldn't come at a more important time. The third study that I did was on underachievement, and this is a study that also was with me for a long time. I spent four years in an urban high school in Hartford, Connecticut, starting with a group of freshmen, uh, 45 academically talented freshmen, and staying with them until they were seniors. By the end of their freshman year, half of these gifted and talented students were underachieving. Many of them dropped out of school. Many of them failed all of their classes. Half of these students. We can't afford in our country, nor in any of yours, to lose half of the identified gifted and talented students in any given school to underachievement. Half. And the underachievement happened for all different reasons. A lack of challenge. Um, a poor academic self-perception, lack of creative opportunity. Are you seeing a theme here? Lack of engagement, inappropriate classroom environments, low self-efficacy, low self-regulation, and poor use of time. All of these things fed the underachievement. And this wasn't minimal underachievement. In some cases, these students flunked out of school. They didn't go to college. And they were in the top 5% academically uh, in the United States. So what are we doing? Why aren't more programs targeted? It starts so innocently. Mom, do we have a shoebox I could have? It's for a school project. I think so. Let's see. Here's one. What are you going to do with it? I'm supposed to make a diorama. We're studying different ecosystems, and I'm going to make a desert scene. That sounds interesting. Yeah, I'm going to need some glue and paper. I'm going to build a cactus and a roadrunner. When is this due? It was due today, but I told the teacher I wasn't quite finished. So many of our brightest kids con their teachers. The product that they hand in to you could be the product of minimal effort, but it's the best one you have, so it gets an A. We know these kids. I've studied these kids. I've spent my life with them. They con you and they get away with so little effort so often. And what happens is it starts with lower grades and then some failing grades. But in the study we did, it was pervasive and devastating. And most of these young people had life failures. They worked at menial jobs. They didn't go to college. Half of a, of a sample of urban academically talented students. The fourth area is probably to me one of, again, the most meaningful studies, the area, the first randomized controlled study on curriculum differentiation, as far as we can tell, done in the United States. And that's the study of curriculum compacting. We were able to do this because of a research grant from the National Research Center on the Gifted and Talented, because good research costs money. And in this particular study, what we were able to unequivocally show, just think about this, we eliminated for 
identified academically talented students, 40 to 50 percent of their content across multiple subjects. 40 to 50 percent of their content. And what happened was in random assignments, some students did all the work, half of the students had half of their content eliminated. There was no change whatsoever in achievement scores, none. They got the exact same achievement scores, suggesting what? In fact, in a couple of those content areas, the students whose content was compacted, whose curriculum was compacted, actually scored higher. <laughs> Gifted and talented students in another study that I did with my colleague Betsy McCoach, over the summer gained more in reading scores than they gained all year long. What does that tell us? That over the summer, they're reading appropriately paced content, while during the year, they're reading stuff that's much too easy for them. This is a theme in the work we've done. Compacting is a simple system in differentiation. We find out what the child has to learn, common core standards. We document and prove that they already know it, and we change it and let them do something else if they can prove that they've done it. I once had a conversation with our good friend Bob Sternberg about this, and Bob said, why doesn't every teacher in the United States do this? It makes so much sense, it's proven by research, and of course the issue is it takes time, it's work, but the benefits are great. And again, the themes between not compacting and then having kids underachieve are so, so tied, so linked. The fifth area is in the area of twice exceptional children. And this was a, I only published a couple of articles on this particular study, but to me, when I look back, it's one of the more, it's one of the studies that I did that touched me the most. I worked with college age students who were entering the University of Connecticut, who had been identified as having, or being both gifted scoring in the top two to five percent. We used uh, 130 as a cutoff on, the, um, on an IQ score in order to identify them, but also who had very, very serious learning disabilities. Dyslexia, spatial problems, um, some had dyslexia and ADD or ADHD, some had um, a, a multiple issues with learning problems. Each of these young people um, were identified late. Each of them had serious struggles in school. In almost every case, they were failed. Their education was, by their elementary and secondary teachers, was not anywhere what it should have been. But yet they made it to college. And they made it to college generally because they had an advocate. They had a parent advocate. They had a teacher advocate. And in these particular cases, I learned so much about this. Now, I don't usually talk about this either. But at that same time that I was doing the study, Joe and I had had a child born late, born early, excuse me, she was a preemie, seven weeks early. Turns out that all through elementary school, we knew something was wrong. I was doing this study during some of the time that she was in elementary school. This took about three years. And lo and behold, she's identified as having a learning disability in fifth grade. I tell you that only because I should have known. And if I, who had spent so much of my life doing this work at work, couldn't figure out that I had a child with dyslexia at home, you can understand how difficult this is for the schools. Why? Because these kids appear to be so bright. They appear to be so verbal. But when you can't read and you learn to compensate in all different ways, identification of these students is very, very challenging. And since you'll be hearing from Megan, Later in the week, I'm going to just indicate to you that this was an incredibly meaningful study to me. Um, it was a qualitative study. I did not do qualitative research again for quite a while. It took a tremendous amount out, out of me. I had football players, big hulking football players, crying in my office when they told me about their, their experiences in elementary and secondary school. And, Again, what do we find? Susan Baum, that's done the most, one of some of the most interesting research on twice exceptional students, found that when we focused on their strengths, we let them do type threes, we let them be creative, we included some talent 
uh, goals in their IEP, that school was much different for them, much more compassionate, much more compelling, much more interesting. And again, so I just say, if we're going to, to develop programs, let's pay some attention to the development of gifts rather than the remediation of deficits. Let's find a, an environment that values creativity and, and let's celebrate strengths in these students, not just deficits. By doing that, I think Joe and I raised a healthy, happy, well-adjusted kid. And guess what she's doing today? She's 27. Everybody told her she'd never go to college because in ninth grade she was still only reading at the third grade level. She finished her PhD in counseling psychology last year and she'll be starting a job as an academic advisor working with grown-up LD students very soon at a nearby university. So are we proud? What we did as parents was focus on her strengths. Um, we did not let anyone tell her she couldn't achieve. We told her she was smart and she was. She had a verbal aptitude in the, in the superior range, but a performance aptitude because of her dyslexia, a 60 point gap. So again, focusing on strengths. The last study I'll talk about is, a, is what I've been working on prior to me taking the new job for the last seven or eight years, and it's a study of talented readers. Um, Dorothy Sisk is in the room, and she's been active in IRA doing this work. Very few of us in the country, actually, this, our country, have worked on this. And those of you from other countries, if you've not worked on this, I would encourage you to do something with it. In the United States, talented readers are often forced to read below grade level for their entire year of school. Oftentimes, students who are reading at a sixth grade level and second grade read from a second grade basal reading program all year. Oftentimes, they can't check out books that are more challenging because there's a fear that the content will be too adult for them. The most meaningful and probably the, the biggest highlight of my academic career was getting this article accepted in AERJ, and this again, is a, is a quantitative study showing that we can eliminate regular reading instruction for academically talented readers, up to five hours a week of regular reading basal instruction, and replace it with differentiated instruction of five to 10 minutes a week, and let students read books of their choice and their interest, and lo and behold, they get the same scores. Just think about that. Five hours a week, elimination of content, and that is not just content, but also instruction. And students do just as well on reading fluency and reading comprehension. What does this tell you? This tells you that you can